Jetco News special coverage of the Future Blockchain Summit is brought to you by Coin Payments, crypto payments made easy. This is Kitco News, I'm Michelle McCory, coming to you from Dubai at the Future Blockchain Summit, the largest cryptocurrency and blockchain event in the Middle East. And I am now thrilled to be joined by Guy Turner, co-founder of Coin Bureau. Guy, such a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Michelle. It's I great am to be here. a big admirer of your work. I think you're doing fantastic stuff. And I wanted to give our viewers who may not be familiar with you, even though they should go check out the Coin Bureau channel, a glimpse of some of the stuff that you cover because you really do a very thorough job of hitting the big themes and headlines. So let's go over some of the big topics of the past month or so. And let's start off with the idea of regulation because that's also always been a big concern for the cryptocurrency industry. And we're seeing increases in regulation, certainly in the EU, the European Union recently passing the first version of the MICA bill, which is the Markets and Crypto Assets Regulation Bill. How significant is this? It's a really, it's a really big step, Michelle, because for a number of reasons. I mean, firstly, the EU prior to this has very much given the impression that it is deeply anti-crypto. And I think there are, very, and there are some very strong anti-crypto elements within the European Parliament, within the EU as a whole. Now, when we first saw, uh, when we saw an earlier draft of the MICA bill a few months ago, it was very, very negative. And there were some, there were some frankly, pretty, pretty crazy things in there. You know, there was talk about trying to destroy the DeFi, decentralized finance sector entirely. There was talk about trying to crash Bitcoin's uh, price by destroying proof of work mining, all this sort of stuff. It was very, very, yeah, it was, it was a bit depressing to see really. So what's been great is that in the intervening period, the EU politicians have gone away, they've consulted. Obviously there have been some pretty, uh, some pretty effective uh, there's been some pretty effective lobbying behind the scenes by crypto companies and I think other interested parties, it's fair to say. And the new bill, the, the new draft of the bill that we've now seen and that is, you know, is, is going to be signed into law very soon, if, if not already, that is a lot more pro-crypto. They've taken out some of this crazier stuff. Uh, they have, I think, accepted as well. Why do you think there's been a change in sentiment? Sorry? Why do you think there's been this change in sentiment and change in approach? I think it mostly focuses around stable coins. So stable coins have been a bit of a bugbear for regulators everywhere. And I think the overarching reason for that is because regulators view them as an essential competitor to the CBDCs, to the central bank digital currencies that they're, you know, they're all looking to roll out at some point. Now, what we've seen in the US, especially with the likes of USDC, uh, uh, with the likes of Circle, which issues USDC, and also Paxos, both of which are pretty heavily regulated companies. In order to back their stable coins, they have to, they have to buy uh, US government debt, essentially. That's what that US government debt, mostly I think two year treasuries, uh, is, is, the, is the majority asset that backs these stable coins. So, what they are doing is essentially financing US government spending. And so to, to bring it back to Europe, now obviously uh, in Europe for a long time, uh, we've seen negative interest rates from the ECB because of the, because of the nature of the European Union, I guess, because of these diverse, you know, diverse economies across the EU. So in order for, it's been basically impossible or not worth anyone's while to issue a euro-backed stablecoin, a euro-pegged stablecoin, because there is no way that the company issuing it could make any, you know, could make any returns on the yield, on the uh, on the reserves that they have to hold. So, what I think is really interesting about this bill is that it's kind of accepted that we now have a euro stablecoin, which is coincidentally also issued by Circle. We've obviously seen uh, the ECB raise interest rates above negative for the first time. And I think what, what MICA essentially says is that Europe is accepting, accepting not just crypto, it's accepting stable coins, it's accepting that they have a role to play behind the scenes in order to subsidize spending. They are basically a source of liquidity. They are bringing money in. 
And I think as well there's a sense that crypto innovation, if it's not allowed to flourish in Europe, which let's remember has an enormous concentration of the right kind of people, you know, people financially literate people, but also computer literate people as well. Right. And I think there is a real, a real concern among figures in the EU now that if something isn't done to to nurture the crypto industry there, then this there will be a brain drain. These people will go elsewhere. They'll come to places like to, to places like here, right. to places like Dubai. They'll go abroad. They'll go across to Singapore. Or, Case in point, and we'll get into more of that about that later. But you yourself are moving to Dubai. Coin Bureau is relocating, so we're seeing that brain drain from London play out with yeah. the Guy Turner as an example. Uh, but before we get into that, I want to focus more onto this idea of regulation. So the bigger theme, as you're saying, if you can't beat them, join them. And the EU has sort of accepted the inevitability. Interestingly enough, though, they are still very much focused on the energy issue. And I believe the bill has cracked down on proof of work with the looking to regulate crypto mining, in particularly the proof of work sector. That protocol, which uses far more energy than proof of stake, of yeah. course. How do you see that playing out? I think proof of work miners will, and I mean, we're talking Bitcoin here because Bitcoin is really the only particularly significant crypto, I suppose, that, that uses proof of work still. Crypto miners, Bitcoin miners, will always go where energy is cheapest and where regulations are easiest. And we've seen this before. I mean, when China cracked down on Bitcoin mining a few years ago, all of, well, only last year, in fact, we saw those Bitcoin miners basically up sticks and move to other more welcoming jurisdictions. And I think there will always be those other jurisdictions that are, that are willing to welcome this part of the industry. And indeed, I mean, we're seeing this in parts of the states as well, because certain US states, namely, I think Texas is the best example, are saying, well, hang on, these guys are, you know, OK, these guys use a lot of energy, but they are producing something tangibly useful. So let's attract them. Let's attract them and their capital. So I think, yeah, we will see if the EU does crack down on proof of work, then we'll see those miners migrate elsewhere. And I think obviously Europe's energy problems at the moment are more pronounced really than anywhere else. So part of me does wonder really whether, whether MICA, whether any EU legislation is going to make any difference. Already that process has started. Any, anyone still mining crypto in Europe is naturally going to be looking elsewhere. Sticking with the regulation theme, before we get into the energy crisis, which is again another topic you've discussed at length, this is the challenge with you, Guy. You touch on so many interesting topics, it's hard to narrow down which one to focus on. But let's go with a broader theme of regulation for now. We do have the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, issuing a report on cryptocurrencies, on global regulation of cryptocurrencies. What was your main takeaway from the IMF report in terms of what it can mean for the crypto market? I think the main takeaway was the, I guess, the attitude of these large, you know, these large international unaccountable organizations. It basically remains the same. It, it remains to be, how can, we, how can we just regulate this? You know, how can we quote unquote protect investors, all that sort of stuff, without giving, I think, enough thought to what is the, how can we meet in the middle? How can we regulate? but also encourage this industry to grow. Is the real incentive to protect individuals? Do you think that that's the real motive or is that just the pretext? I think the real, I think the real incentive is to figure out how they can tax this industry, you know, how they can extract the most, the most money from it. And I just don't think that we've seen, I don't think that we've seen the right sort of moves to protect investors from anyone. It's always, they never seem to be picking the right targets. You know, it's always going, it, it might be the SEC going after someone high profile like Kim Kardashian or anything like that. You know, I think what needs to be done more is to, is to crack down on, you know, on these, on these Ponzi scheme projects themselves. You know, it's, but we just don't see, we don't see any kind of joined up thinking. Do you see a potential crash in the cryptocurrency sector or uh, a bear market as we're in right now, mm. as serving as a pretext for the IMF to come in with stronger regulation. Is that laying the groundwork for, 
for stronger intervention, which may not necessarily be in the greater interest of the cryptocurrency market at large. Absolutely, absolutely. We saw, we had a taste of it when Terra collapsed a few months ago. And, you know, obviously that was, that was terrible for a lot of investors. But yeah, that was certainly, I think, gave a sense that these, that these you know, wider organizations, they are waiting for the next crash because yeah, as you say, that does serve as an excellent pretext and go, oh, well, you know, people are losing money on crypto, therefore we have to, we have to stop it without, without looking at any sort of longer term picture. The idea of regulation has always hovered as an existential threat to cryptocurrencies, especially to Bitcoin, and that that may be the biggest challenge to a fiat currency standard, many would say. Where are we in terms of the level of threat that regulation poses? Is there anything that you see derailing the cryptocurrency market where we are now? I think there are perhaps two two main you know two main possible uh, I guess you call sort of black swans for the crypto market in that sense. I think one is if the internet was to be shut down, which I, I think is probably hopefully fairly unlikely. I know we've got a lot of power outages out there. But. There certainly are. We can't we can't rule anything out. Um, I think the other threat is yeah coordinated global uh, legislation, and I think again this is what worries me about about organizations like the IMF. You know, they have, they have influence in so many different jurisdictions and they are, you know, I think they are often able to provide the, the links between them. However, that said, I think, I think the chances of any sort of global standard of regulations, I think that is pretty unlikely because I think the world is becoming so much more polarized now. And I think the, the, the Russia invading Ukraine is a great example, you know. We are seeing very much a split between East and West. And I think that split is only, and I think it'll also widen as well between the so-called developed world and developing world as well. I think, I think we are gonna see more polarization between countries and between regions. And I think that is gonna make it very difficult for any sort of global standard of regulation to, to come into being. Yeah, we definitely are seeing the bifurcation of the global monetary system to your point. So you're feeling safe in saying you do not foresee Bitcoin ever going to zero? I am happy to say 100% that I don't think Bitcoin will ever go to zero. I think Bitcoin still has a lot of challenges ahead of it. I think the crypto sector as a whole has a lot of challenges ahead of it. And I do believe that there are lots of organizations out there like the IMF, like the Bank for International Settlements, like the Financial Action Task Force, that do actively want to, to destroy the industry. And that does, that does trouble me. But if we're talking about Bitcoin itself, the, the rabbit is out of the hat, if you like. The genie, the genie is out of the bottle, maybe a, a better analogy. But yes, and that's what, so, that's what for me is so fascinating about it. This is something that's out in the world. It's beyond the reach of governments. And I think I do get the sense that governments are beginning to accept that now. You know, we're hearing kind of less of this sort of rhetoric. We're hearing less of people saying, oh, well, we need to turn off the blockchain and things like that. Because I think, you know, they're starting to realize that you, you don't just, you can't just turn off the Bitcoin blockchain. You can't just stop this thing that's in motion. But yeah, there are still challenges, certainly. How much of a challenge do you see worldwide adoption of central bank digital currencies to Bitcoin? Again, I think that's I think that's a threat, and I think obviously that is something um, you know it's viewed the other way around. The central banks themselves, that is why I think they view crypto as such a threat because this is their this is their eventual end game. I do think as well it could. I mean, from what I've from the research that my team and I have done, the chances of you know your average person, your your average uh, your average population, say in any given country, actually voluntarily adopting a CBDC is very, very low. And I think this is something, again, this is something that crypto taps into so well, this, this, this growing distrust of the fiat financial system, this growing sense, you know, post 2008, that banks can't be trusted. And so people, I think, are more and more waking up to the idea that they need to take responsibility for their own finances. You know, this being, you know, this, this banking yourself and, and crypto is such a big part of that. But certainly, yeah, CBDCs are going to, 
that once they start being rolled out en masse, that's certainly going to change the landscape in, in how that Bitcoin and other cryptos operate. And that brings us to the global reset, where CBDCs are going to play a very big role. For our viewers that are not familiar with the global reset, conceptually, what is it? So this is this idea that, that the IMF, the World Economic Forum, again, the, these organizations, this is... These unelected bodies, these bodies that are not accountable to anyone. Yeah, I mean, how, I wonder how many I wonder how many viewers out there can name, you know, any more than one or two members of the IMF or the World Economic Forum. You know, these are these are very shadowy people, and but obviously they are they are hand in hand with major global corporations across the world. You know, these so-called stakeholders, and the Great Reset is very much about this idea of you know of how these how these how this kind of stakeholder capitalism can can take roots can you know almost almost going kind of beyond borders and stuff and it, it, a lot of it is about is about control and surveillance and again this is where cbdc's come in this idea of being able to see what people are spending when they're spending what you know what they're spending it on and even put limits on those things which for me is is one of the scariest parts of it there's also, I think, there's a there's a growing realization from companies and also from governments as well that, especially in developed countries, there is an enormous demographic decline going on. And I mean, we could we could talk about the reasons for that for, for hours on end. But I think what that essentially means is that there are over time going to be fewer and fewer consumers. So the problem for the problem for World Economic Forum stakeholders and people like that. How do, we, how do we continue this growth cycle? How do we continue to grow the economy? How do we continue to sell stuff to people? And when, when, we, were, when we were researching this, uh, this video on the Great Reset, that one of the things that really struck me was this idea of basically hardware as a service. So rather than you going out and buying a new phone, say, you'd simply, you'd simply rent it, you'd pay a subscription, a bit like you do with your, your Netflix or your Amazon Prime or whatever it may be, you would pay a subscription, a monthly subscription, and whenever your phone became obsolete, you know, whenever it, uh, whenever there was a new model that the company wanted to put out, they would you'd send your old one back and they'd just replace it. And that way, they're able to to lock in a consumer for life. But the problem is, as the you know, as this kind of infamous saying goes, you'll you'll own nothing. Yeah, and, and be, be happy. And you'll be own happy. nothing and be happy. <laughs> So what is then, would you say, the end game of the global reset, of the great global reset? The great global reset. I think the end game is control. I think the end game is governments and corporations being able to... To what end? Control to what end? I think control to influence, influence how we live our lives, influence how we spend, you know, where we spend. Again, you know, it's, it seems to me to be... This and again, this constant, this this idea of constant growth, this constant inflation, and this is something again that I've talked about more recently. This idea, you know, inflation is one of the most destructive forces, really, on the planet. You know, it, it's it, it's kind of the root cause of so many of the problems that we feel: overconsumption, environmental degradation, you know, no upward mobility, increased inequality. All these sorts of problems, I think, can very much be traced back to this idea of inflation, which itself comes from this constant, constant desire to grow. And I think it's, I think the end game for people like the IMF, etc., and the, and the World Economic Forum is to, is to basically keep this, keep this going indefinitely because it benefits their members, it benefits their stakeholders, not unfortunately the rest of us. Linked, of course, to the idea of the reset is the notion of carbon credits and monitoring our carbon output, which was a topic of another fantastic video that you put out. Briefly explain how all of these things come together. The ESG movement, carbon credits, social credits, CBDCs, and the Great Reset. It's all part of the same idea. Yeah, yeah, gosh, it's, it's, such, a, it's, such, an enormous, it's such an enormous topic, isn't Who it? Who better so to many... put it all together than you, Guy? I'll do my best. Summarize your last 20 videos in the next 30 <laughs> seconds is what I'm saying. It's all about inflation. Um, 
Well, I think, yeah, so, I mean, this idea of, so let, let's, let's, let's talk about these individual carbon credits for a sec, because this is, this is grown out of an idea that, you know, the, the corporations that are responsible for overconsumption, that, you know, keep bringing out, you know, keep bringing out more things for us to buy, they don't want to be, you know, they don't want to be ultimately responsible for that. They want to shift the, the blame for overconsumption onto the consumer. And we're obviously seeing these, we, we've had these institutional carbon credits for quite some time now. And this is a kind of, as I said, in the, as, I, as I talked about in that video, this is a kind of growing global market. And I mean, let's face it, it's, it's the way that com companies like Tesla, for instance, Tesla makes more from selling carbon credits than it does from selling cars, which is, I mean, which is crazy really. But we're seeing this kind of scramble for this this new asset class that, it, that you know that these corporations have have created, and I think extending that to the to the general population again that's that's partly about control. Let's say you exceed your your yearly carbon allowance, then you can't do this, you can't do that. But you can do that if you're just able to purchase more carbon credits. So again, it's I think it's about extracting extracting liquidity, extracting money from everyday people and basically propping up the inflationary fiat system that we have at the moment. So if the end game is to use the ESG movement, the climate change narrative to exercise more control and to be able to have individuals' purchases controlled through carbon credits and central bank digital currencies, for example, my CBDC is frozen because I've taken 20 flights this year and I've exceeded my carbon output yeah. and I, unless I buy more carbon credits I'm not able to use my money to purchase another flight for example if that is the scenario correct me if I'm wrong that you think we're heading towards and that many people agree with you that we are heading towards if that is an inevitability how do I profit from it what is the best way <laughs> if this is coming and I have to deal with it what is the best way that an investor can then be ahead of the curve and find a way to extract personal profit or personal benefit from a very unfortunate situation that's coming in the future. But if it's coming, how does one milk the chaos? Very good question. Very, very ruthless. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I guess you could, I mean, for one thing, I speculated on this in the video on individual carbon credits. You know, if you are able to buy into this, it's no, it's not it's not easy for individual investors. Again, you know, these markets are generally only open to the accredited investors. But I think it's not impossible for individuals to get their hands on, you know, it, to get to get access to the carbon credit market. So that could be, you know, that could be an interesting way to do it. You know, you. How does a retailer get access? A retail investor get access to the carbon credit market? The short answer is, I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> but... I look forward to the video explaining <laughs> that. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think there are, you know, from 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 what I've from what I've heard talking to, to various people and researching, you know, there are ways to do this. I think you probably do need connections with, you know, connections in the financial markets that most, you know, normal people wouldn't have. Uh, but I think the best way perhaps to ensure, you know, ins not only ensure yourself against this future, but to also profit from it, is to buy Bitcoin. Because I think the, the demand for a form of money that is beyond the control of any government or wider organization that isn't linked in any way to how much carbon you use or don't use, which can be exchanged peer-to-peer -peer like cash. I think the demand for that in the future is going to be enormous. And that is one of the reasons why I myself am invested in Bitcoin and have been for a very long time, because I believe that this technology, you know, this is really the best weapon that I think the individual has that is something that is open to everyone. Trustless, permissionless, all these other all these other adjectives you attach to it. But what's crucial is that anyone with an internet connection can buy Bitcoin. And that for me is what's so exciting. So the best weapon against the great global reset that is coming is Bitcoin. I, th I believe so. Yeah, I believe so. Because again, it puts you in control of your finance. It, it means that you will be able to interact with people quite outside this CBDC system. 
and I think, I do believe that that's, that is what we will end up seeing. We will end up with this system whereby people are using CBDCs because I don't think they're going to have any choice about that. You know, nobody wants to be, good, or very few people want to be completely locked out of the entire economy. And unfortunately, that is going to be the, you know, that is going to be the alternative. But I think there will be this huge global movement of people who are, you know, anyone who wants to transact privately, anyone who doesn't want to, the government to see a particular transaction for whatever reason that may be, I think that, you know, they will be transacting in Bitcoin. And I, I truly believe that Bitcoin will be, if not the world's official reserve currency, then an unofficial reserve currency, which may in fact be an even better outcome. So I'm assuming, safe to say, you're very bullish on the long-term price of Bitcoin. Very bullet, yes. Crucially, the, the crucial term there is long term. Long term. Yeah. Do you have any kind of price forecast in the very long term for Bitcoin? I, Michelle, I generally, I generally try and stay away from price predictions because Smart man. <laughs> <laughs> they're the sort of thing, they're the sort of thing that can come back to haunt. You know, people always remember when you got it wrong, or you know, and very rarely when when you got it right. If you did. Um, but I think, you know, in the future, and we are talking much longer term here, we're talking perhaps into the 2030s and the 2040s, I think Bitcoin will be changing hands for, you know, well over six figures in dollars, uh, obviously you know, adjusted for inflation perhaps. But yeah, that is, I, you know, it's, it's so difficult to, well, it's impossible, isn't it, to, to, have, to have any sort of, uh, you know, time frame, narrower time frame on where this is going. But I think Bitcoin will be one of the one of the most sought after assets out there. And it's Bitcoin that got you into cryptocurrencies in the first place. That's so right. The ability to purchase a beer using Bitcoin? Yeah, yeah. So I went to, uh, I went to the pub in, uh, in London where I was living back then. And it was, um, it was a quite a trendy part of London. So, you know, the kind of place where people kind of experimented with new things. And this was 2013, and I saw a sign behind the bar of this pub, and it said, we accept Bitcoin. And that is how I remember my first, my, you know, my first interaction, my the first time of hearing about it. It might be that I'd heard the word before and it just hadn't registered, but that's the moment I went, had you What's had a that? few pints at the time? <laughs> did that perhaps impact the revelation there? I think it did. I think I went back and sort of got on the laptop and maybe with beer goggles. Yeah, Looking the beer goggles. Sort beer of goggles. Maybe, yeah, maybe I, uh, maybe I was just too in too receptive a, uh, a state at that time. But yeah, I remember going back and looking at it and being quite baffled by it at first. I didn't. I wasn't. One, I, I've never been one of these people who just gets it straight away uh, because there were you know there were a lot of people in the who are still in the crypto industry and, and you hear from them and they they say oh yeah I understood it like that and I didn't and I had to dig a lot deeper to try and understand it and I mean I'm still learning about perhaps it perhaps that's why your videos are so excellent because you come at things from a simple explanatory perspective for those that don't just automatically get it that's that's what we set out to do. Yeah, it, it, and you do a great great job of it, if I may say. So, with all the knowledge that you've collected recently, what do you think is the biggest factor driving the markets at the moment? I think perhaps at the moment it's the Federal Reserve, unfortunately. Speaking of unelected officials <laughs> and speaking of unaccountable bodies. Yeah. There is an unelected official of an unaccountable body that is essentially controlling the world. But go the, on. The most powerful man in crypto at the moment is Jerome Powell. Yeah, it's it's an extraordinary situation. And I mean, I have to say, I think the Fed at the moment is doing the right thing. I think inflation has to be got under control. I think people look to the Fed and to the United States. Other nations look to them for, I think, guidance on these issues. Obviously, the Fed dropped the ball by by not acknowledging soon enough that inflation was going to be a problem. But I agree with the position that they are in now, and I think they're doing the right thing to raise interest rates. Uh, Jerome has said that he's willing to you know, break the economy. He's willing to push the US economy into recession. I honestly don't see an alternative. As much as that is painful, as much as that is going to be felt by everyone, I think you know, most people across the world, I don't think there's an alternative to that. So. 
And I, I, lots of people talk about the Fed maybe pivoting in the future. I, I personally don't see it. Myself. You do not see it. I, I think we're going to see interest rates. I don't. Th I'm not sure if they'll get as high as the 1970s. I mean, the name of uh, Paul Volcker's name is, is is invoked almost like a sort of deity nowadays, yeah. isn't it? But I think yeah, we we're in for a prolonged period. I think of interest rate rises, and I think the Fed will be desperate not to pivot too soon because I think they will have to see inflation around that 2% target and get staying around that 2% target for a considerable period of time before it eases off, before rates start to go down. And obviously, you know, that in theory will supercharge the economy and bring back brighter days and, and all that sort of stuff. But for now, I think we are, yeah, we are very much being, Jerome is the puppet master. Yes, not only of the crypto markets, but of all markets and of the world, because of course, with the higher interest rates, we're having strengthening the dollar. We're having continued strength in the dollar, yeah. which you have said could be a wrecking ball to the global economy, the strong dollar. Very much so. And I mean, we've seen this, you know, the, the situation in the UK just a couple of weeks ago was, you know, it was a real kind of wake up call to a lot of people in that respect. Obviously, you know, the, the British the British gilts market kind of went haywire, plunged after, you know, after this mini budget. And but it really threw into perspective, you know, just how strong the dollar is. And obviously that is that, that in a way is a very good thing for for the United States. But I think long term it's also a very bad thing as well. It's gonna hurt global exports. You know, we can't I don't think this this idea of one currency being supreme and you know kind of crushing all others is i think is only going to hasten a, a general flight from the dollar and of course this is the last thing that uh, the us authorities want so i think it's very important not just for the health of the global economy but also i think for the health of the us economy uh, that the dollar is able to you know is able to stop pumping quite as much as it has. So if I may summarize, Jerome Powell, to preserve his legacy, is going to channel his inner Paul Volcker, continue with his hawkish stand, continue raising interest rates. That means the dollar continues to strengthen, but ultimately that's gonna lead to the crack in the global monetary system. Quite possibly, quite possibly. I think that is, I think that is a very likely scenario and you know, there is this sense, isn't there? There is this sense that we are on, we're kind of teetering on a precipice. We do get that sense, yeah. I really do, and I'd so many, I mean, it's hard because I sometimes feel like I'm in my, in my own sort of echo chamber kind of talking about this. And, you know, you all, I, have the, I have all the sources that I go to across the internet for, you know, to find this information. And, you know, people, people I watch and, and, and learn from and all this sort of stuff. But there does seem to be the sense that, yeah, I, a, a, a really bad global recession, you know, and I mean, in some parts of the world, that is already the case. But I think it's very hard. It's very hard for me to see how we how we're able to enter a new cycle of growth, how how things are supposed to go back up again without going down further. I think I, I think there is a bottom and we and we kind of need to see it. Well, that is the natural economic cycle, right? Yes. Uh, and even in nature, you have to destroy things, burn things down for them to sprout again. Speaking of echo chambers that uh, you're listening to, what has been your main takeaway from the summit here in Dubai? It's, I think the main takeaway is just the level of, the level of excitement and the level of innovation around, going on around the blockchain and crypto space. General interest in crypto is so low at the moment. If you look at Google search trends, anything like that, people in general just aren't interested, you know. And I guess that's understandable because so many people are underwater or, you know, so the crypto prices aren't doing anything dramatic. But what I get from the sense from here is that that isn't as important as people would think. What's really important is all the building that's going on behind the scenes. There are still projects launching. There are projects still developing, you know, going along with their roadmaps, recruiting team members. You know, everyone is, everyone is looking to grow. And that, I think, that is partly because places like Dubai are making such efforts to attract this industry. And it gives me, it gives me a lot of hope because I think 
when things do eventually get better, when the next bull market comes around, for instance, those projects are going to have been built today. And speaking of Dubai attracting great things and great people, again, you've moved to Dubai. Coin Bureau is moving its headquarters to Dubai. Tell us about that quickly and what we can expect in the future from Coin Bureau. Coin Bureau is, we're looking, to, we're looking to expand. We not only want to grow as a YouTube channel, we don't just want to reach more people, um, but we want to, we want to uh, widen the team as well so as we can expand the scope of our research. We're also expanding the scope of our business as well. We have a recruitment arm now, we have an events arm, we're looking to move into consulting, various other aspects of the industry because we want to cement ourselves as a force in this industry and as a force for, for good in this industry, obviously. So it feels like Dubai is a place where we can do that, where we can grow, where we can attract talent. And also it's a way of bringing together our team that is very much spread out all over the world. We have, uh, we have people based in Europe, we've got people based in North America, in Asia, in South Africa, people all over the world. And this seems like the place to try and bring them together so as we can exchange ideas, so as we can be in you know, closer, better communication with each other and, and grow Coin and basically fulfill the potential that we think Coin Bureau has. And it all started with you wanting a beer in a pub in London. <laughs> this is all good things do. <laughs> we will have to grab a beer after this conference. Absolutely. Guy, it has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michelle. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Kitco News special coverage of the Future Blockchain Summit is brought to you by Coin Payments, crypto payments made easy.